The barometer was still falling, and the wind increased until it was a perfect hurricane. The captain and the mate said that they had never seen a wilder sea. Between two and three in the afternoon, I managed to get on deck, though the pitching made it difficult. The scene I shall never forget. It was a grand one beyond description. The sea, lashing itself into fury, was white with foam. There was a large ship astern us and a brig to our weather side. The ship gained on us, but drifted more. The waves, like hills on either side, seemed as if they might swamp us at any moment. But the ship bore up bravely. On account of the heavy sea, we were making little or no headway. And the wind being from the west, we were drifting quickly, irresistibly, toward a lee shore. Unless God help us, the captain said, there is no hope. I asked how far we might be from the Welsh coast. Fifteen to sixteen miles, was his reply. We can do nothing but carry all possible sail. The more we carry, the less we drift. It is for our lives. God grant the timbers may bear it. He then had two sails set on each mast. It was a fearful time. The wind was blowing terrifically, and we were tearing along at a frightful rate. One moment high in the air, and the next plunging head foremost into the trough of the sea, as if about to go to the bottom. The windward side of the ship was fearfully elevated, the lee side being as much depressed. Indeed, the sea at times poured over our lee backwards. Thus the sun set, and I watched it ardently. Tomorrow thou wilt rise as usual, I thought, but unless the Lord work miraculously on our behalf, a few broken timbers will be all that is left of us and our ship. The night was cold, the wind biting, and the seas, we shipped continually with foam and spray, wet us through and through. I went below, read a hymn or two, some psalms, and John 13 to 15, and was comforted, so much so that I fell asleep and slept for an hour. We then looked at the barometer and found it rising. We had passed the Bardsley Island Lighthouse between Cardigan and Carnarvon Bays, running up the channel, and I asked the captain whether we could clear Hollyhead or not. If we make no leeway, he replied, we may just do it. But if we drift, God help us. And we did drift. First the Hollyhead Lighthouse was ahead of us, and then it was on our outside. Our fate now seemed sealed. I asked if we were sure of two more hours. The captain said we could not be. The barometer was still rising, but too slowly to give much hope. I thought of my dear father and mother, sisters and special friends, and the tears would start. The captain was calm and courageous, trusting in the Lord for his soul's salvation. The steward said he knew that he was nothing, but Christ was all. I felt thankful for them, but I did pray earnestly that God would have mercy on us and spare us for the sake of the unconverted crew, as well as for his own glory as the God who hears and answers prayer. The passage was then brought to my mind. Call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. And very earnestly I pleaded the promise. Our position now was truly awful. The night was very light, the moon being unclouded, and we could just see land ahead. I went below. The barometer was improving, but the wind in no way abated. I took out my pocketbook and wrote in it my name and home address in case my body should be found. I also tied a few things in a hamper which I thought would float and perhaps help me or someone else to land. Then, commending my soul to God my Father, and my friends and all to His care with one prayer, that if it were possible this cup might pass from us, I went on deck. Satan now tempted me greatly, and I had a fearful struggle. But the Lord again calmed my mind, which from that time was so stayed upon Him that I was kept in peace. I asked the captain whether lifeboats could live in such a sea. He answered, No. Could we not lash spars together and make some sort of a raft? He said we should probably not have time. The water was now becoming white. Land was just ahead. We must try to turn her and tack, said the captain, or all is over. The sea may sweep the deck in turning and washing everything aboard, but we must try. This was a moment to make the stoutest heart tremble. 
He gave the word and we tried to turn outwardly, but in vain. This would have saved us room. He then tried the other way, and with God's blessing succeeded, clearing the rocks by not more than two ships' lengths. Just as we did so, the wind most providentially veered two points in our favor, and we were able to beat out of the bay. Had not the Lord thus helped us, all our efforts must have been in vain. Truly, His mercy is unfailing. Hudson Taylor's journal recorded the events of his voyage is, and it is full of interesting experiences, occasional excitement, and even more monotony of 23 consecutive weeks of sailing without touching land. Much of his time was spent in his cabin, reading, studying, and preparing for his missionary ministry. But he also held more than 60 religious services for the sailors aboard the ship. The men seemed interested, and some came to Hudson at times for private talk and prayer. But he was somewhat discouraged that so little permanent change resulted in their lives, and that none of the men made complete commitments to Christ. But perhaps one of the most encouraging and most trying experiences of the voyage occurred during days of doldrums in the South Pacific, when the only progress was made between sunset and dawn, when the light evening breezes would blow. Of those days, Hudson wrote, Never is one more helpless than in a sailing ship with a total absence of wind, in the presence of a strong current setting toward a dangerous coast. In a storm, the ship is to some extent manageable, but be calmed, one can do nothing. The Lord must do all. This happened notably on one occasion when we were in a dangerous proximity to the north of New Guinea. Saturday night had brought us to a point some thirty miles off the land, and during the Sunday morning service, which was held on deck, I could not fail to see that the captain looked troubled and frequently went over to the side of the ship. When the service was ended, I learned from him the cause. A four-knot current was carrying us toward some sunken reefs, and we were already so near that it seemed improbable that we should get through the afternoon in safety. After dinner, the long boat was pulled out, and all hands endeavored, without success though, to turn the ship's head from the shore. After standing together on the deck for some time in silence, the captain said to me, well, we have done everything that can be done. We can only wait the result. A thought occurred to me, and I replied, No, there is one thing we have not done yet. What is that? he queried. Four of us on board are Christians. Let us each retire to his own cabin, and in agreed prayer ask the Lord to give us immediately a breeze. He can as easily send it now as at sunset. The captain complied with his proposal. I went and spoke to the other two men, and after prayer with the carpenter, we all four retired to wait upon God. I had a good but very brief season in prayer, and then felt so satisfied that our request was granted that I could not continue asking, and very soon went up again on deck. The first officer, a godless man, was in charge. I went over and asked him to let down the clues or corners of the mainsail which had been drawn up in order to lessen the useless flapping of the sail against the rigging. What would be the good of that? he answered roughly. I told him we had been asking for a wind from God, that it was coming immediately, and we were so near the reef by this time that there was not a minute to lose. With an oath and a look of contempt, he said he would rather see a wind than hear of it. But while he was speaking, I watched his eye, followed it up to the royal, and there, sure enough, the corner of the topmost sail was beginning to tremble in the breeze. Don't you see the wind is coming? Look at the royal, I exclaimed. No, it's only a cat's paw, he rejoined, a mere puff of wind. Cat's paw or not, I cried. Pray, let down the mainsail and give us the benefit. This he was not slow to do. In another minute, the heavy tread of the men on deck brought up the captain from his cabin to see what was the matter. The breeze had indeed come. In a few minutes we were plowing our way at six or seven knots an hour through the water, and though the wind was sometimes unsteady, we did not altogether lose it until the passing of the Palu Islands. Thus God encountered me ere landing on China's shores to bring a variety of need to him in prayer, and to expect that he would honor the name of the Lord Jesus and give the help each emergency required. It was a lesson that he would soon put to the test.
and now the years 1854 to 1855. China seemed even more forbidding to an uninvited foreigner in 1854 when Hudson Taylor first reached its shores than it would today. Shanghai and four other treaty ports were the only cities in which Westerners were allowed to reside. and There was not a single Protestant missionary anywhere in the interior. The curiosity with which the Chinese pu people viewed foreigners was more than matched by deep feelings of suspicion and fear. Civil war was raging, and the entire country lived in chaos. The Taiping Rebellion, which started as a populist movement for social, economic, and religious reform, and was viewed by many Westerners as the best hope for an end to the repressive Manchu dynasty, had bogged down. Lack of unity and discipline among the ranks caused the movement to disintegrate slowly into factional, destructive political strife. What many had hoped might actually result in at least a nominally Christian Chinese culture instead resulted in bitterness, violence, bloodshed, and turmoil that would continue for 11 years after Hudson Taylor's arrival in China until the Manchu dynasty reestablished a large measure of its former power. Years afterward, when he would himself be responsible for the guidance of many missionaries, it would be much easier to see the value of all the hard lessons learned during his early time in China. But at that time there seemed so many lessons to learn, so many hardships to experience. Where Hudson had dreamed of traveling to the city of Nanking, and soon thereafter to minister as the first evangelist in China's interior, he now find nearly insurmountable difficulties just getting established in Shanghai. As Hudson neared the shores of China, Shanghai was in the grip of war. A renegade band of rebels known as the Red Turbans was in possession of the native city near the foreign settlement. And 40 to 50,000 imperial troops were encamped around the city. Fighting was almost continuous, and the foreign militia was frequently called upon to protect the settlement. But Hudson Taylor knew little or none of this when he finally arrived in Shanghai on March 1, 1854. My feelings on stepping ashore, he wrote, I cannot attempt to describe. My heart felt as though it had no room and must burst its bonds, while tears of gratitude and thankfulness fell from my eyes. Just as quickly the loneliness and reality of his situation sank in. Not a single person was there to meet him not even a stranger to shake his hand and welcome. In fact, no one in Shanghai knew he was coming, and not a soul on the entire continent even knew his name. He later wrote, Mingled with thankfulness for deliverance from many dangers and joy at finding myself at last on Chinese soil came a vivid realization of the great distance between me and those I loved, and that I was a stranger in a strange land. I had three letters of introduction, however, and counted on advice and help from one, especially to whom I had been commended by mutual friends, whom I knew well and highly valued. Of course, I inquired of him at once, only to learn that he had been buried a month or two previously, having died of a fever while we were at sea. Saddened by these tidings, I asked the whereabouts of a missionary to whom another of my introductions was addressed, but only to meet with further disappointment. He had recently left for America. The third letter remained, but it had been given me by a comparative stranger, and I expected less from it than from the others. Indeed, while inquiring about this third gentleman, only to be told he was no longer there, Hudson Taylor felt utterly alone. But a colleague of the third missionary invited Hudson to stay for a time on the property of the London Mission until he could be suitably settled. Hudson soon learned of some of the challenges he would face. All consumer goods were sold at famine prices, and both the city and settlement were so crowded that suitable housing could scarcely be obtained at any price. Had it not been for the hospitality of Dr. Lockhart of the London Mission, he would have had nowhere to stay. Even so, sharp fighting was to be seen from his windows and he was unable to walk in any direction without witnessing more horrible suffering and human misery than he'd ever imagined. 